Chapter 1 Who the hell is this? barked Amos Decker. He had been awoken from a sleep far deeper than he usually achieved. The insomnia had been getting worse, and it was adding nothing positive to his already unpredictable temperament. He hadn't looked at the phone number on the screen before answering it. In his line of work, calls came at all times of the day or night and not always from those on his contact list. Amos, it's Mary Lancaster. Her voice was low, tenuous. Do you remember me? Amos Decker sat up stiffly in his bed and rubbed his unshaven face. He saw on his phone screen that it was nearly three in the morning. Since I pretty much can't forget anything, it's not likely I'd forget you. Is it, Mary? He patted himself on both cheeks, working to remove the fuzziness from his mind. Then his thoughts settled on the timing of the call, which was in itself a warning. In a tense voice he added, Mary, is something wrong? Why are you even up now? Mary Lancaster was Decker's former partner in the Burlington Police Department in Ohio. A while back she'd been diagnosed with early onset dementia. The disease had spiraled continually downward as her brain deteriorated and dragged the rest of her along with it. I'm fine. Couldn't sleep. To Decker, she didn't sound fine at all. But he hadn't spoken to her in a while, and this might just be how she was now. I have trouble with that too. I just wanted to hear your voice. It just seemed so important to me right now. I've been working up the courage to call you. You don't ever have to worry about calling me, even in the middle of the night. It's so difficult to understand time, Amos, night and then day. But then, everything is very difficult for me to understand right now. And, it's so very frightening because, every day there seems to be less and less of me, th there. He sighed as the tragic sincerity of her words hit him especially hard. I know, Mary. I understand why you feel that way. Yes. I believe that you would. Her tone had firmed up a bit. Decker hoped it was a positive sign. He leaned against the creaky headboard, as though using the wood to fortify his own spine in dealing with this unexpected development. Decker surveyed the dark confines of his small bedroom. He had lived here for years, but it looked like he was just moving in, or else was simply passing through. He was a consultant with the FBI. Long before that he had suffered a near-fatal brain injury while playing professional football. His altered brain held two new attributes which, up to that point, he hadn't even known about, and had no reason to, hyperthymesia, or perfect recall, and synesthesia, which caused him to pair certain things with unlikely colors. In his case it was dead bodies linked with a shade of electric blue. After his football, Career ended he had become a policeman and then a detective in his hometown, thus, seeing dead bodies was not all that unusual. He and Lancaster had successfully partnered on many cases. Having a perfect memory was a godsend for a detective, but a thousand-pound ball and chain for a human being. Time did not heal any of his past miseries. If anything, they were more intensified. He lived in an apartment in Washington, D.C., in a building owned by a friend of his, Melvin Mars. Decker had first met Mars while the man was on death row in Texas. He had proved Mars's innocence, and Mars had received a substantial financial windfall for his wrongful incarceration. He'd used some of it to buy the apartment building. Mars had recently married and moved to California. Decker's longtime FBI partner, Alex Jamison, had been transferred to 
New York and found what looked to be love with a Wall Street investment. Banker His old boss at the FBI, Ross Bogart, had retired and was learning. To play golf badly, he had heard, in Arizona. That meant Decker was now alone, which he knew he would be one day. The phone call from his old partner was thus welcome, even at this hour. How are you, Mary? I mean, really, how are you? SOSO, she said. Every day is a challenge. But you sound good. You mean I can put sentences together? The knee medications help me. With that, sometimes. This is one of those times. I'm not usually like this. I'm usually not good. He decided to reroute the conversation. How are Earl and Sandy? Sleeping, I suppose. That was Mary's husband and their daughter. They went to visit Earl's mother in Cleveland. She's not doing well. Probably won't be long for this world. She's old and gaga like me. Actually. You don't sound gaga to me, Mary. Yes, well. Wait, if they're in Cleveland, who's staying with you? The last time he had visited her, there had been an aide helping out. I'm okay right now, Amos. It's all right for me to be here. I don't know, Mary. I don't have a good feeling about this. You don't have to worry about me. She sounded almost like the old Mary. Almost. But there was something else going on here that he didn't like. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 2 Decker put his large bare feet on the cold wood of the floor. I've been meaning to come to visit you. It's been too long. But you sound better than last time. Yes, it has been too long. Far too long. But not you. Me. Decker straightened up and eyed the window, where the city lights winked lazily at him in the darkness. I, uh, I don't understand, he replied. I guess I'm still half asleep, he added by way of explanation, but she wasn't making much sense. This is a terrible thing I have in my head. It's awful. I know, Mary. And I wish you didn't have to deal with it. He stopped and struggled to come up with more sympathetic words. It was a task that would have been easy for his old self and nearly impossible for his current. One. I, I wish there was a cure. For you, too, she said. There is no cure for you, either. In these words he could sense her seeking some level of solidarity with him in diseases of the mind that would end up doing them both in. We're a lot alike in that regard, he agreed. But also not alike, she retorted in a tone she hadn't used before. It was an escalation of sorts, at least he took it that way. Decker didn't know how to respond to that, so he didn't. He sat there, listening to her breathing over the phone. In the ensuing silence he could also feel something building, like Thrust did on an airplane about to take off. He was about to break the silence when she did. Does it keep changing? she asked in a small, measured tone. He knew exactly what she was referring to. It seems to, he answered. But everyone's mind changes, Mary, healthy or not. Nothing is static. Normal or not, whatever normal is. But you're the only one I know who truly, who could maybe understand what I'm going through. He heard a sound over the line and thought she might be slapping herself in the head, as though trying to dislodge in there what was slowly killing her. He tried to think of something to say, to draw her back to the conversation. But I thought you were getting counseling. It helped me. It can help. You. I did get counseling. But then I stopped getting it. But why, he said as his anxiety rose higher. They told me all I needed to know. 
After that, it was a waste of time. And I don't have any time to waste, Amos, not one fucking second. She let. The blunt epithet hang there in the ether like smoke from a discharged gun. Mary, please let me know what's wrong. I can tell some things. Happened. Sharp as a pistol shot she barked, I forgot Sandy today. Right before. They left to go to Cleveland. I forgot her. People forget names all the time, Mary, said Decker, sounding a bit. Relieved. He sensed this was where the conversation was intended to go. When all was said and done. He didn't think this when next she spoke. I didn't forget her name. I, I forgot who she was. There came another. Lengthy pause where all Decker could hear was the woman's breaths and then a sob that was so dry and drawn out it sounded like she was strangling. Mary, are you? She continued as though he hadn't spoken. She said, I just remembered. Her before I called you. And only because I looked at a photo with her name. On it. I forgot I had a daughter, Amos. For a time there was no Sandy. Lancaster in existence for me. Can you understand how terrible that is? He could almost sense the tears tumbling down her sallow cheeks. I was this close to, to not. Ever again. Forgetting my own child. My. Flesh and blood. You shouldn't be alone, Mary. I know what you said, but I can't believe. That Earl. She cut in. Earl doesn't know that I am alone. He wouldn't want that. He's normally very careful about that. Decker stood, rigid in hushed anxiety. Her response was stealthy and, far. Worse, coolly victorious. He could feel clammy sweat forming all over him. Then who's with you? The aide? She was, but I made her leave. In a bewildered tone he said, how exactly did you manage that? She. Shouldn't have. I have a gun, Amos. My old service automatic. I haven't held it in. Years. But it fits my hand so fine. I remembered the gun safe combination. Can you believe that? After I forgot pretty much everything else, I. Remembered that. I suppose it was an omen of sorts, she added. Off-handedly. Every muscle the decker had tightened. Wait a minute, Mary. Hold on. Now. I pointed the gun at her. And she left, very quickly. Right before I called. You. I woke her up, you see. With the gun. It makes you wake up fast, you. Know that. Decker was now more awake than perhaps he'd ever been in his life. He glanced wildly around trying to think of something, anything. Look, Mary. Put the gun away right now, just put it down. And then go and sit as far away from it as you can, and just close your eyes and take deep breaths. I'll have someone there in two minutes. No, one minute. Just one minute and help will be there. I won't disconnect from you. Stay on the line. I'm going to put you on hold for just a sec. She wasn't listening to any of this. I forgot my daughter. I forgot as Sandy. Yes, but then you remembered her. That's the point. That's, you have to keep. Decker clutched his chest. His breathing was ragged, his heart beat. Gawning in his ears, flailing pistons of disruptive sound. He felt a stitch in. His side, as though he'd run a long distance when he hadn't taken a single. Step. He felt nauseous and unsteady and helpless. He thought fast. Surely the aide would have called the police. Surely. They were already on their way there. 
What about tomorrow, she said, interrupting these thoughts. Will I remember her tomorrow? Or Earl? Or you? Or me? So what does it matter? Can you tell me that? Mary, listen to me. She was crying so hard, my little girl was. Mommy doesn't know who. I am. She said it over and over and over. She was so sad, so unhappy. I did. That to her. To my own little girl. How can you hurt someone you love so? Much? Her tone was now rigid, unforgiving, and it froze the surging blood. In Decker's body. Listen to me, Mary, listen closely, okay? You're going to get through. This, okay? I'll help you get through it. But first you have to put the gun. Down. Right now. Decker put a hand against the wall to steady himself. He. Imagined the gun in her hand. She might be staring at it, considering things. The floor under his bare feet felt fluid, rocky, a ship's deck in pitchy seas. He searched his mind for the right words that would draw her back from the edge she was on that would make her put down the little automatic that he knew she had killed at least one man with during her professional career. If he could just come up with the right words that would let this episode end. Well when it could so very easily go the other way. He was about to speak again to convince her to wait for help. He had his Lines ready. He was about to deliver them. They would make her put the gun down, he was sure of it. Then he heard what he had prayed he would not hear. A single shot, which he believed, because he knew Lancaster had been delivered with deliberate care and competent accuracy. She would have chosen the temple, the chin, or the open mouth as her entry point. Any one of those would get the job done. And then came the oppressive thud of Mary Lancaster's body hitting the floor. He was certain she was dead. Lancaster had always been a good planner, results-oriented. Such people excelled at killing themselves. Mary? Mary, he shouted into the phone. When no response came, his energy wilted. Why are you screaming? She's gone. You know she is. He leaned back against the wall and let gravity transport his big body. Down to the floor, similar to the one on which Lancaster's corpse was now. Lying. He was alive. She was not. Right now it was a difference without. Significant distinction for him. He sat there as his little room was lit by the. Electric blue of a death that had touched him from nearly a thousand miles. Distant. Years ago Amos Decker had once come within a centimeter's width of a. Trigger pull of shooting himself in the mouth and ending his life. But right now, part of him was as dead as Mary Lancaster. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 3. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And other assorted bullshit, thought Decker. That was the way it always ended. That and a deep, unforgiving hole. Closed up with dirt. A suited Decker, usually comfortable only in jeans or wrinkled khakis and a loose sweatshirt, stared down at the eternal birth tobe in the ground. It would soon be filled with Mary Lancaster's boxed remains. It was a chilly, drizzly day in Ohio. For this area it was very normal. Weather in spring, the vestiges of winter clinging like a dewy spider's web. To a frosted windowpane. The crowd here was large, Earl and Mary. Lancaster were well-known and well-liked, and Sandy had made many. Friends at her school. Decker eyed numerous former colleagues from the local police force, who all stared darkly at the ground. Alex Jameson had been on assignment and unable to come, but had sent 
a card, and her condolences. Ross Bogart had done the same, along with flowers. They hadn't known Lancaster that well, but Decker still wished. They could have been here with him. He usually eschewed company, but not today. The casket had been closed. The gunshot had been fired upward through the mouth, leaving Mary Lancaster beyond the magic of the morticians. Cosmetics, and thus unviewable. Decker looked over at Earl Lancaster, ashen-faced and lost and old. Looking, as he clutched the hand of his teenage daughter, Sandy, who was learning disabled. The girl's eyes darted here and there, processing the world in her unique way. She might not understand death the way others did, Decker knew, and that might be a good thing, at least right now. But, at some point soon, she would realize her mother was gone. And she would wonder when her mother would be back. And Decker did not relish being in Earl's position to have to explain what had really taken place when that gun had fired. There would be no good way to do so, he thought. But it still had to be done, because Sandy deserved an explanation. Sandy suddenly caught sight of Decker, broke free from her startled father's grip, and ran over to him. She stared up at the giant man, her face sparkling in a sea of gloom. You're Amos Decker, she declared brightly. This was a game that they played, well, she did. And Decker always answered as he was about to now, though it was not easy to form the words. This time, I know I am. And you're Sandy Lancaster. She grinned and cracked, I know I am. As soon as she finished speaking, Decker's features crumpled. I forgot who she was. For a time there was no Sandy Lancaster in existence for me. Mary Lancaster, at least in her mind, could not have committed a graver sin than not remembering that her daughter existed. He was certain that was what had placed the finger on the trigger and given her the strength to pull. It. He felt a nudge on his hand and opened his eyes to see Sandy small. Slender fingers curling around his long, thick ones. Amos Decker, she said again, watching him carefully, perhaps too. Carefully. For some reason he knew what she was going to ask, and it panicked him beyond all reason. Where's my mommy? There are so many people. Do you see her somewhere? I need to talk to her. Decker had never lied to Sandy, not once. He couldn't lie to her now, so he said nothing. Sandy. Earl came running over and took his daughter's hand. Sorry. Amos. Decker waved this apology off, turning to the side to wipe his eyes. Then. He leaned close to the other man and spoke into his ear so Sandy wouldn't. Here. I'm so sorry, Earl. Earl gripped Decker's arm. Thank you. Um, we're having a little. Gathering at the house right after the service. I hope you can come. Mary. Would have wanted that. Decker nodded, though he had no intention of going. Earl seemed to read. This in his features and said, well, it was good to see you. Decker glanced at Sandy to see her gaze riveted on him. He saw betrayal in her features, but that might have been due to his own sense of guilt. Placing it there. Earl said softly, the police told me that she called you. Thank you for trying. I wish I had been more. I know. He watched them walk off to the car provided by the funeral home. The rest of those in attendance began straggling away, some flicking nods and glances and sad smiles his way. No one approached him, though. They all knew the man too well. And then Decker was alone because he preferred it that way. As the cemetery workers started to lower the coffin into the hole, 
precisely dug for it, Decker turned and walked mechanically along through the graves until he reached a certain spot beside a certain tree. He did not need a perfect memory to find this place. He simply needed a bereaved heart. This was a difficult pilgrimage for him. There was probably no other kind. Cassandra Decker. Molly Decker. Mother and daughter. His wife, there. Child. The love of his life, his flesh and blood, taken from him by a murderer's hand. The flowers he had laid here on his last visit had long since disintegrated, much like the bodies lying below. He brushed these fragments away and knelt down next to the twin graves. Once, when he had been here visiting his dead family, a dying man named Merrill Hawkins had wandered out of the woods and demanded justice from Decker, in connection with the first case Decker had worked as a homicide detective. Decker had accepted the challenge, and in doing so, had proved his younger self wrong and his older self correct. And Hawkins had been given justice, however belatedly and posthumously. Decker had also tracked down his own family's killer. He had served justice in both cases, but it was, without doubt, a hollow outcome, marred by the fact that the justice was delivered too late for the victims. No amount of justice could return the dead to the living, the satisfaction gained from learning the truth was dwarfed by the loss. He said the words he needed to say to his wife and child, and then rose from the cold ground and glanced to the left. There was an empty plot there. Mine. He had come close to filling it on several occasions, once by his own hand, while staring at his murdered child as she sat, in death, in her own house. Will my perfect memory fail one day and I'll forget I had a daughter? He had still been on the line when the police had arrived at Lancaster's house. He had talked first to the officer, and then the detective, a man he knew from the old days. There had been sadness exchanged on the loss of a life well known to them, a grudging acceptance of the choice made, and of the motive behind it. He walked back to his rental car. His flight to D.C. was scheduled for the next morning. He had no idea what would await him when he got there. And Amos Decker wasn't sure he cared anymore. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 4 The letter waiting for Decker was from the Cognitive Institute in Chicago, or C.I.S. Decker and everyone else there referred to it. He had gone there the month before for some routine tests, which they had done on him annually ever since he had been there as a patient after his football injury. He put his suitcase down inside the door of his apartment and tore open the letter with his thick finger. It was several pages long, which surprised him. Usually, they were much shorter. But usually there was nothing really to tell him. This time was different. He sat down and read it through twice, though his perfect memory had already imprinted all of the contents in his mind forever. He slowly tore the pages into strips and threw them into the trash can. Well, okay. His phone buzzed. He looked at the text and groaned. He was to come to the Washington field office immediately, or so. Commanded his superior at the bureau. He glanced once at the trash can where the destroyed letter rested and then grabbed his car keys and walked out the door. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Amos Decker, meet your new partner, Special Agent Frederica White, said John Talbot in a voice that sounded like a game show host introducing a new prize. The massive Decker looked all the way down at the five foot three inch black woman and she looked back up the mountain at him. It was unclear. Which one was more surprised by this announcement? New partner, said Decker, glancing at Talbot, who had taken over for 
Ross Bogart. I didn't ask for a new partner. Alex. Special Agent Jameson is not coming back, or at least not anytime soon. And so we have transferred in Agent White from Baltimore to work with. You. White had never taken her eyes off Decker. Her expression was. Unreadable. She was in her mid-thirties, lean and wiry, packing about 105. Pounds on her petite frame. Her caramel-colored hair was cut to FBI. Regulation length and held in place with a pair of tortoiseshell barrettes. Decker noted the small hole in her left nostril for a stud, although FBI. Regulations forbade the wearing of any such item while on duty. At the end. Of her right jacket cuff, he could just make out a greenish mark protruding. From under the cloth. A tat. She had on two-inch zipper boots that lifted her within a foot of his. Height. No stilettos for FBI agents, despite what the TV cop shows had there. Female actors wear. Black jacket and slacks, white shirt, button to the top. No cleavage, ditto on the TV shows. Thin lips, green flinty eyes, slender. Dark eyebrows atop them, a sharp-edged nose, high cheekbones, jutting chin. The woman was all sharp edges. You can shake hands, you too, said Talbot encouragingly. The two did not shake hands. They just stood there like they were afraid. One was trying to get the jump on the other. Talbot, a man waiting for the full pension and the exit door that came. With it, smiled deeply, and said in a fake cheery voice, I'll just leave you. Two to get to know each other better. The door closed behind him. I didn't ask for this either, just so you know, said White. Then why are you here? She gave him the full hiked eyebrows treatment. The hole in the side of. Her nostril quivered with something, maybe suppressed energy or rage. I was unaware I had a choice since the Bureau signs my paycheck. But. I didn't know I would be partnering with you until 30 seconds ago. Then we have that in common, said Decker. But I don't want to work. With a new partner. So you have a choice, she said. Apparently not. I know Alex Jameson. She's a good agent. She told me things about. You. Why? You said you didn't know you were partnering with me until just. Now. Word gets around, Decker. Don't think there's another one like you in. The Bureau. What did she tell you? Between me and her. By the way, I go by Freddy, just in case you were. Wondering. Is this enough getting to know each other? Because I've had my fill. He said. Good enough for me, but if we walk out of here now Talbot will just. Make us have lunch together or something, and I doubt you want that. Decker edged over to the window and looked out on a cloudy day, his. Thoughts just as muddled. He detested change, and here he was being hit by. It on all sides. He could either leave the bureau or endure a new partner. Named Frederica slash Freddy. Which scenario would be worse? He didn't know. I heard about your old partner back in Ohio. That was a real tragedy. My sympathies, added White. She sounded sincere. Decker didn't turn around. She was a good cop. She didn't deserve to. Go out that way. Does anybody? I can think of a few. Anything you want to know about me? He turned to her, mildly intrigued, and said, What do you think is? Important? I'm divorced. Got two kids. My mother lives with us, helps to take care. Of them. I grew up in Philly. I had three brothers, and I have one sister. Had. One brother died by gunshot during a shootout with another gang, and. One's in prison until he's an old man. My oldest brother is an attorney, and. Works for the public defender's office in Boston. 
My sister has her own tech business and lives in Palo Alto in a house worth more than I will ever make in my life. You always this open with strangers? You're my partner. You have to have my back and I yours. Okay, too. Finish my personal highlight reel, I went to Howard University for my undergrad. Got my master's from Georgetown. Joined the Bureau 13. Years ago. I've fired my gun twice in the line of duty. I'm small, but I hit. Above my weight and I bite really hard. Got a double black belt in karate. Not because I love martial arts, but because I hate getting my ass kicked. Both physically and symbolically. I do not tolerate idiots or laziness or bullshit, and I encounter way more of all three than I need to write here at the Bureau. I like to know where I stand at all times. As a person of color. And a woman on top of that, I find it a necessity to my future well being and that of my family. And nothing is more important to me than that. How old are your kids? 9 and 12. Daughter and son, respectively. Calvin, named after. My father. And Jacqueline, but she goes by Jackie. Do you share custody with your ex? I was still carrying Jackie when my ex decided marriage and fatherhood were not for him. I have full and permanent custody. Calvin doesn't even remember his father and that's a damn good thing. You still live in Baltimore? I was working in Baltimore until this morning. Plan to move here? If I can afford anything down here, which I doubt unless I want to live. In the nosebleed seats. And I'll wait and see. Sometimes new assignments. Don't stick. Yeah, sometimes they don't. Decker said a silent prayer on that one. What about you? What about me what, he said. Anything to share? If you spoke to Alex, you know all you need to know about me. But nobody tells it as good as the person himself. I don't tell anything remotely good about myself or anybody else. White took this shot and fired off one of her own. You know, you're smaller than I would have thought. He looked down at her. I'm a wall, only not one you lean on. It's just that Alex made you out to be nine feet tall and eight hundred pounds. Compared to that description, you're sort of shrimpy. I can't help feeling disappointed. But nevertheless, are we good to go, partner? Decker said with all due candidness, at this point, I don't really give a shit. You always this way with the people you work with? Initially, yeah. Well, let's work quickly through initially then. Decker looked her over. I'm sure you're a fine agent. I have nothing against you. But change like this is not my thing. And I've had more of it in my life than most people. She glanced up at his head. Football player? Cleveland Browns? I hate the Browns. I'm an Eagles girl through and through. Hate the Baltimore. Ravens, too, and that's all I see now. I don't really follow football anymore. She glanced at his head once more. Yeah, I guess I can understand. That. The door opened and there stood Talbot. His features grim, he did not. Seem remotely like the cheerful man from a few minutes ago. You too have your first case. You're heading to Florida. Right now. What happened, said Decker. A federal judge and her bodyguard. They're both dead. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 5 Thank God for mothers, said White as she settled in her plane seat next. To Decker. Especially on short notice. She takes care of the kids while you're traveling? Yep. Otherwise, I couldn't do it. Childcare is outrageously expensive. 
even when you can find it. Lucky she was a young mother. Still got a lot of energy. Five kids will age you fast. She worked, too, as the assistant principal at the school where we all went. My dad was a cop in Philly. Never made that much money. Is he retired? He died in the line of duty. Sorry to hear that. My mother got a big settlement from the city. Why was that, he said curiously. Because the dude that shot my father was also a cop, who didn't like the color of my dad's skin. And then the department tried to cover it up and make it look like an accident. This was 20 years ago, I was still in high school. Civilizations don't always progress, they sometimes regress. Didn't expect that from you. Why not, he asked. I don't know, to tell the truth. After the jet lifted into the air, White said, you read the email they sent. About what happened in Florida? Decker nodded. What do you think? I don't think anything. Somebody else's version of the facts in an email. Doesn't mean anything to me? I need to see it for myself. Well, what I got from it was this was an inside job, or at least the killer. New things he shouldn't have. You're making assumptions that aren't justified yet. Like what? she asked. That it was only one killer. And that it was male. I was just speaking generally. I like specifics much better. So explain why you think that, he said. The person or persons knew the judge's routine. No forced entry. Horror. Personal security was killed without him fighting back. That tells me that he didn't perceive what was happening as a threat. The judge was killed and there was no sign of a struggle. She didn't try to call for help. So she might have known whoever it was who killed her. The guard. Two. But why let someone in if they just killed your protection? White. Asked. She either didn't know that it happened, or something even more. Devious was going on. She's divorced. Ex lives in the area. Right. So the ex-hubby's a possible suspect. Spouses, and particularly exes, always are. Don't I know it, replied White. The plane started shedding altitude an hour and a half later, and they landed at the Southwest Florida International Airport near Fort Myers. A rental car was waiting for them. White drove while Decker wedged himself into the passenger seat of the midsize four-door. White glanced over at him as they pulled into traffic. Sorry, it's all they had. Shortage of rental cars these days. I've never ridden in one that was remotely comfortable, so my expectations are non-existent. Agent from the local RA is on the scene, she said, referring to an FBI resident agency. I know. The bodies are still there, too. They're apparently holding them for us. He glanced at her. Are you trying to screw with me? No, I'm trying to be informative. Don't. Alex said you could get testy. You haven't even seen mildly annoyed, much less the other side of the Rubicon. Thanks for the information, she replied. I like to know where I stand. He recited from memory, as a person of color and a woman on top of that, I find it a necessity to my future well-being and that of my family. Alex also said your memory could be frustrating at times, but she worked around it. Decker looked out the window at the bright sky and said, I never liked Florida. When I played ball at Ohio State, we would come down to play. Florida and Florida State and Miami. Hated every second of it, and not only. Because their players were so much faster and athletic than we were. Why? Too much heat or too many old people? 
or both? No, it's because I'm just a lunch pail guy from the Midwest. Meaning? I hate sand. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 6 They drove up to a gated community in the town of Ocean View, which was situated about half an hour north of Naples. The roar of the breakers from the nearby gulf shared the ride with them. This place looks like a postcard, noted White as she stopped the rental. At the guard hut. Not where we're going it doesn't, replied Decker. The guard came out of the little shack. He was in his forties and walked. With a swagger more befitting a Navy SEAL than a luxury community. Rental cop gatekeeper. Can I help you, he said as White rolled down her window. She flashed her FBI ID pack. White and Decker. We're here regarding the murder of Judge Julia. Cummins. Right, right, said the man as he eyed Decker. While White was still in. Her black suit with the white shirt, Decker had on khakis and a faded dark. Blue sweatshirt. You must have come from up north, said the guard. It's almost never. Sweatshirt weather here. Have you provided the list of guests and residents who entered here? Over the last 24 hours, said Decker. Provided to who? The cops, said White. They haven't asked for it. Okay, we're asking for it now, said Decker. I'll have to check with my supervisor. Then go ahead and make the call while we're waiting, because we need that info now. Don't you need a warrant for that sort of stuff? Did you kill the judge and her guard, said White. The man took a step back. What? Hey, no way. Then we don't need a warrant. People coming through this gate have no expectation of privacy. And this is a murder investigation. So we need to know who came through here and when during the last 24 hours at least. So make the call to your supervisor, said Decker. And bring the information to the judge's house. We'll be waiting for it. Ah, uh, okay. And open the gate, said White. Oh, right. The man quickly did so, and they drove through. If that's the quality of the security here, I'm surprised only two people are dead, noted White. Well, there might be more that we don't know about yet, said Decker. Cummins's home was large and of Mediterranean design with white. Stucco siding and a red tile roof. It was situated on a shady, quiet cul-de-sac. The plantings were mature and well-tended. This tranquility was marred by police and unmarked cars parked all over and yellow crime scene tape vibrating across the front yard in the brisk breeze. Decker noted a blue sedan parked in the driveway. Might be the dead. Security guards ride. How do you figure that? Every other ride here is either a police cruiser or has Florida. Government or federal plates. Could be Judge Cummins's car. A woman who owns what looks to be a two or three million dollar. Home is not driving a dented up ten year old Mazda. And she would have. Pulled it into one of those three garage bays, not left it in the driveway. And. Check out the bumper sticker. White read it off, the feds are watching you. Not something you'd typically see on a federal judge's car. They parked at the curb, cleared the security at the front door, put on. Booties and vinyl gloves helpfully provided by a member of the forensics. Team, and stepped inside. Decker was immediately hit by a searing vision of overpowering electric. Blue. This was his synesthesia working overtime. His whole life, in fact, was represented by an overactive memory plus sensory pathways that had crossed streams like a clover exit off a highway. He put a hand against the wall to steady himself because when the electric blue hit him, it made his balance momentarily say bye-bye. Deep breaths, in and out. 
When White looked at him she didn't say a word, which made Decker instantly suspicious. He would have to deal with that later. His new partner was getting on his nerves by just being silent. The short, stocky man marched into the foyer of the house like he was a CEO entering a boardroom for a meeting. He was in his late forties and dressed in press slacks and a navy blue jacket. His tie and shirt were immaculate. His hair looked like it had been pressed with an iron. His features were sharp, his expression sharper still. And he was just the sort of stuffed shirt official prick that Decker detested. He flashed his cred pack. FBI Special Agent Doug Andrews out of the Fort Myers R.A. Of course you are, thought Decker. And you are? Andrews said. White produced her cred pack. Decker just stared at the doorway. And this is Amos Decker, said White. We just flew in from D.C. Andrews's expression soured. I wasn't told they were sending in agents. From out of town. I was just told to hold the bodies here. I wasn't given a reason. Well, we're the reason, said White. Andrews looked at Decker's casual dress and said, I didn't see your ID. What was the name again, Decker? Decker looked around the grand foyer. Delicately furnished with expensive items arranged just so. Custom paint and wallpaper. Antique. Grandfather clock ticking away in one corner. Rugs were thick and colorful. And no doubt expensive. He could smell death in every corner of the place. This was not his imagination. Dead bodies were decomposing in the near. The vicinity and the foul smell was unmistakable. He saw a bloody palm print on a wall leading to the stairs. On the stair. Runner were other blood marks. They had number cones next to them, the mark of the forensics teams doing its processing. He saw a chalky fingerprint. Powder everywhere. He could hear the clicks of cameras and the murmurs of conversation. Everything was going as it should. Now he had to deal with this asshole, which he didn't want to do. Without looking at the man Decker said, we were sent down to assist in the investigation. We have the matter well in hand. And I. Decker walked past him and into the next room. Hey, barked Andrews as Decker disappeared around the corner. He looked back at White. What the hell is with that guy? Like me, he's just here doing his job. And if you have a problem with us being here, you're going to have to take it up with HQ. But right now, we're going to work, just like you. She followed Decker into the next room. Andrews hurried after her. You're listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 7 Decker had experienced crime scenes galore during his time in law. Enforcement. And he remembered every detail of each one. This one looked. Both routine and also unique in certain respects. This was the judge's study or home office. Bookshelves, a desk, a small. Leather couch, a wooden file cabinet, a sleek desktop computer, and a tabletop copier. One window looked out onto the rear grounds. Paintings on the wall, nice knickknacks, a colorful oriental rug over wooden floorboards. Nothing looked disturbed, no evidence of a frantic search for something or a robbery or struggle having taken place. Everything neat tidy, in its place. Then, on the floor, a body. But not the judge. A man. Obviously, the security guard. Private, not a U.S. Marshal as was usually the case with a federal judge. He was in his thirties, lean, six feet, close-cut brown hair that 
rode like a soft cap on his skull. He was not wearing a security guard's uniform, but rather a dark tailored suit and a white shirt with a red blotch in the center and two holes as the cause of the blood and his death. Someone was taking no chances. The edge of his holstered gun poked out from his jacket. Decker knelt down and checked the suit label, Armani. He looked at the watch on his wrist, Cartier. The shoes, Ferragamo. Interesting. The dead man was spread-eagled on the floor, sightless eyes looking up. At the small chandelier hanging from the ceiling. He had a couple days. Worth of beard stubble. Even in death, his features were handsome, if now. Very pale. His expression was one of surprise, if a dead person could hold. Such an emotion. And some could, Decker knew. He eyed the forensics team, doing their thing. He approached one, a woman in her forties dressed in blue scrubs and masked as she entered. Some information on an iPad. White followed. You the me? Got a preliminary cause and time of death? She glanced at him in surprise and then looked around until she saw. Andrews standing in the doorway. He grudgingly nodded at her as he walked up to stand next to Decker. I am the me, Helen Jacobs. We're looking at a pair of GSWs to the chest, looks like they pierced the heart. Death instantaneous. Todd is. Between midnight and 2 a.m. last night. White said, any signs of forced entry? None, replied Andrews. And who called you guys down here, agent? White. SAC John Talbot out of the WFO. Give me your number and I'll text. You his contact info. I thought you had been informed. Andrews did so and White sent him the info. Anything taken, asked White. Still checking. Nothing readily apparent. Name of the deceased, asked White. Alan Draymond, replied Jacobs. We understand he was private security, said Decker. Who with? Gamma Protection Services, answered Andrews. We contacted them. And we'll set up an interview. Wearing a suit and not a uniform? Gamma has a number of levels of protection. They do mall, warehouse, and office security, assignments like that. For protection at this level, they have higher skilled operatives. Higher skilled? Like the dead guy, said Decker, eyeing him closely. Like the dead guy, Andrew shot back. Nobody's perfect. White said, why a bodyguard? Was she getting threats? Checking on that with Gamma, said Andrews a bit petulantly. And if so, why not a U.S. Marshal, said White. That's the way it usually works with federal judges, right? Again, checking on that, said Andrews, now huffily. But the judge could hire private security if she wanted to. She could afford it. Decker looked at him. You knew her? Acquaintances. I live in Ocean View. It's sort of a small town vibe. Here. Did Draymond fire his weapon? asked White. It's still in its holster, replied Andrews. And the killer or killers could have put it back there after he fired it. Noted Decker. Andrews stiffened and said, We'll check. Any trace of the killer? White asked. Jacobs answered, most of the prints we found so far belong to the judge and a few to Draymond. There are some others, though, that we haven't identified yet. No footprints that we could find. There's a low pile. Carpet runner on the stairs that didn't show any trace. And hardwood floors. Here in the study, upstairs hall, and the deceased's bedroom. Tough to get. Anything from that. It hadn't rained or anything, either, so no shoe. Impressions that we could find. 
and the judge's body, asked Decker. How did she manage to do the stairs after she was wounded? Jacobs looked at him curiously, then said, you saw the blood trail on the stair runner when you came in, and on the hardwood floor leading out of here. Hard to miss with your little cones set out. But it was really the bloody palm print on the wall next to the stairs. I assume that must be the judge's. Since two shots to the chest means Draymond wouldn't have made it out of this room under his own power. Jacob said, I think she was stabbed once down here and the killing took place upstairs in her bedroom. Let's go, said Decker, not liking the two words I think. They avoided the evidentiary trail on the carpeted steps and reached the second floor landing, where Andrews led them into the bedroom. Killer didn't step in the blood from downstairs, asked White. No, he was careful about that, said Jacobs. Judge Julia Cummins was lying on her bed wearing a short white terry cloth robe. The robe was open, revealing the woman's black underpants and a white camisole. Someone had put a blindfold over her eyes, but then cut out holes in the cloth where the eyes were. There was blood all over her clothing and on the bedspread and also on her hands, the bottoms of her feet and her knees. She's been stabbed repeatedly, said Jacobs. Ten times by my unofficial count, not counting defensive wounds. Cod was blood loss due to the stabbings. So she was downstairs where she was attacked, ran up here, and the intruder came up and finished her off, said White. Appears to be that way, said Jacobs cautiously. Stabbing someone that many times is personal, noted Decker. Andrews interjected, but we have a ways to go. It's a complicated crime scene. Decker eyed the twisted covers and took in the fact that the mattress was out of alignment with the box springs. White must have been reading his mind. Looks like a struggle took place there. You mentioned defensive wounds, asked Decker, noting the cuts on the woman's forearms. Jacob said, yes. It's natural for a person getting attacked with a knife or blunt instrument to use their arms to block the blows. Multiple slashes. However, the wound to her lower sternum was probably the fatal one. From the location in depth, it likely cut right through her aorta. I'll know for certain when I do the post. Any trace under her fingernails, asked White. None that I could find on a preliminary exam. I'll look closer when I do. The post. Blood on her hands, knees, the bottoms of her feet, noted Decker. Andrews said, explained by the fact that she was attacked downstairs. Stepped in her own blood, maybe fell, and got blood on her knees. Ran up. Here. Mark on the wall by the stairs where she no doubt put her hand to. Steady herself, and spatter on the stair runner. Any signs of sexual assault, asked Decker, who did not look. Convinced by this theory as the blood spatter images from the stairs and the study marched across his mind's eye. Jacobs replied, I did a prelim. No signs of that. I'll know more once I get her on the slab. But I don't think she's been sexually assaulted. Decker looked at the blindfold. Nice of the killers to leave us this little symbol. Andrews stepped forward. Why blindfold her, but then cut the hole so? Her eyes are showing? The blindfold was most likely put on post-mortem, noted Jacobs. Of course it was, said Decker abruptly. You said symbolic, said White, looking at the blindfold. Decker said, the lady was a judge. Justice is supposed to be blind. Only. With her, I guess it wasn't, or at least in the opinion of her killer, since they made sure she was seeing clearly, or as clearly as the dead can. Andrews sucked in a sharp breath. Shit, that could be true. 
Where did the blindfold come from? asked Decker. From the judge's closet, answered Jacobs. It was taken from a set of handkerchiefs she had. Any trace of the killer left in the closet or here? Footprints, residue of blood spatter from stabbing the judge, asked White. We've found nothing so far. We're still dusting for prints, and we'll take the prints of family and friends for elimination purposes, of course. Decker said, so this might have been heat of the moment. The killing certainly seemed to be. And the killer used the judge's handkerchief instead of bringing one already fashioned as a mask. What did the killer use to cut the holes? We found nothing that had blood on it that would have been used. The killer might have used the knife to do it and then took it with him. Or her, said White, who then noted the card in an evidence bag next to the dead woman. The card was found here, she asked. Jacobs nodded. It was actually placed on her body. White looked at the card in the clear plastic bag. Residential Ipsiloquitur. She glanced over at Decker, who was watching her. Any paper or pen here matched the card and the ink, asked Decker. The pen is generic, but we've found no match here on the card so far, said Andrews. The killer might have brought it. Any prints on the card, asked White. No. If the killer brought the card, that does smack of premeditation, noted. White. Yes, it does, said Decker. But that coupled with the mask and the frenetic stabbing makes this a very contrarian crime scene. Decker looked around the space and noted a photo on the nightstand. In the picture was the deceased, and on either side of her a man and a teenage boy. Andrews picked up the photo with his gloved hand and said, that's Judge Cummins, of course. And that's her ex-husband, Barry Davidson, and their son, Tyler. Looks like this was taken at the club, judging by the background. The club, asked White. Harbor Club. It's right down the coast, about five minutes. They were. Members. Well, the judge was. And her ex and her son? Where are they? We contacted Barry Davidson. He lives nearby. Alibi? He was with his son. It was the week he had him. So his son is his alibi, said Decker. Yes. I understand the boy is devastated. How old is he? Seventeen. Do you know the ex and the son? asked Decker. I've met Barry Davidson. And you know this club, obviously, since you recognized it in the photo. Yes. I belong to the Harbor Club, too. Decker eyed the man's costly suit and shoes. Is that your Lexus? Outside? Yes, it is. What about it? Nothing. Is the Mazda Draymond's ride? Yes, answered Jacobs, looking anxiously between the two men. Decker said, So, what's your theory on what happened here last night? Agent Andrews? Andrews glanced at White and then took a moment to compose his thoughts. I think it seems reasonably clear. Since there was no forced entry, either one of the doors was unlocked or the person or persons was let in. The fact that the judge was in her underwear leads me to believe that Draymond was shot first. The judge, on hearing something from her, bedroom, put on a robe, came downstairs, and was attacked. She ran back to her room, probably to lock herself in, but wasn't able to. They killed her. Here. Then they left the card and put the blindfold on her. If Draymond let the person in he must have known them. Either on his own, or because they knew the judge, said White. But if the murders occurred between midnight and two, that would be pretty late for a visitor, observed Decker. 
Could Draymond have been in on it, let the person in, and then had a change of heart, or the killer intended on leaving no witnesses behind, said. White. Andrews said, that's certainly possible. Who called the police about the bodies, asked Decker. They got a call from the neighbor next door, Doris Klein. She went out. On her rear deck this morning to drink her coffee and read her iPad, and saw. The back door of Cummins's house open. She went over to make sure. Everything was okay. It was after nine at that point. And the judge was. Normally on her way to court before then. Klein walked in the rear door. Went into the kitchen and then through to the study, where she saw. Draymond's body. She ran back to her house and called the cops. They. Found the judge's body, too, and called us in because of her federal status. I've already contacted the U.S. Marshals Service to loop them in. I've been. Busy here, but I plan to interview Klein next. Decker nodded absently and surveyed the room once more, imprinting. Every detail onto his memory cloud, as he liked to refer to it now. When. He'd first learned he had perfect recall he'd named it his hard drive but times changed and he had to change with them. His hyperthymesia was an amazing tool for a detective, but it was also overwhelming at times. He had been told that there were fewer than a hundred people in the world who had been diagnosed with the condition, and Decker would have preferred not to have been one of them. Most people with hyperthymesia concentrated their recall on personal Events, memories from the past, mostly autobiographical in nature. Because of that, Decker had learned that they often tended to live in the past as well. Because the stream of recollections was unrelenting. While Decker certainly had some of that, too, his memory recall was different. Pretty much. Everything he heard or saw or read in the present was permanently encoded in his mind and could be pulled out at will. He turned to Jacobs. T.O.D. on the judge? Approximately the same range as Draymond. Midnight to 2 a.m. I might be able to get a little tighter on the parameters, but that time box is looking pretty solid. He handed her his business card. Let me know about Draymond's gun and the possible sexual assault. All right. He looked at Andrews. We told the guard at the entrance gate to get us. The list of people who came through over the last 24 hours. He was. Going to bring it here. I had planned to do that, said Andrews. Good, we're operating on the same wavelength. While we're waiting. For him, let's go talk to Mrs. Klein. He walked out of the room. Andrews whirled on white. How long have you and Decker been? Partners? White checked her watch. Oh, about six hours. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 8 Doris Klein ushered them into her home after they knocked and led them to the rear lanai. She was in her late fifties with permed hair and too much. Makeup, at least to Decker's mind. But what the hell do I know? Klein had on a pair of white slacks and an orange shirt with the sleeves. Half rolled up, revealing taut, tanned forearms, mottled over with coppery. Sunspots. She was skinny for her five foot eight height, and the woman was. A smoker, which might have been a factor in her thinness. A pack of camels and a purple Zippo lighter sat on the table on the screened-in lanai, which overlooked the backyard. Beyond that were some slender palm trees and compact shrubbery. A pool was situated in front of them. From the smell it was apparently filled with salt water. Through the screens enclosing the space, Decker noted a well-trod path down to the beach with the dull gray stretch of the gulf just beyond that. Seagulls swooped and dove across the 
clear sky looking for things no human could see. The house was smaller than Julia Cummins's place and hadn't been kept up as well. The stucco was damaged in several areas, and the outdoor heat pumps heavily rusted from the heavy salt air had drawn Decker's notice. The lawn and landscaping hadn't seen much attention, either. He didn't know if that was simply the result of indifference or a lighter wallet than the judge had had. Were you the only one in your house last night? asked Decker. Klein blew smoke from her nose and nodded as she reached for a glass of what looked like orange juice, but Decker smelled the alcohol in it. I was. I'm divorced, my kids grown and off. I don't go out much. Because my ex left me with lots of bills and not enough alimony. He had the better lawyer, unfortunately. Can you take us through this morning? asked White, her eyes widening, apparently at the woman so casually revealing this personal info. I came out here around nine, saw the rear door was open, and that seemed strange. At that hour of the morning Julia had usually long since left for court, and she really never used that door. She just went right from the house to the garage. Did you know her well? asked Decker. We were neighbors and good friends for years. I'm sure you're upset about what happened, interjected White. Klein tapped Ash into a crystal bowl, her lips firmly set. I'm not a crier. But I'm very distraught that Julia is dead. I cared for her. A lot. We were. Good friends. We would vent to each other. But I've seen a ton of shit in my. Life. The best defense is just to keep it at arm's length, at least that's my. Take. So, you investigated and found the body of the man in the study, said. Dakar. Scared the crap out of me. I ran right out and called the police. They. Were here in maybe three minutes. There's a station not that far from here. You knew the dead man, said White. I'd seen him at Julia's. I never spoke with him. Did the judge discuss with you why she needed security? Not really, no. I guess all judges get threats and stuff. Hell, these days. Who doesn't? Look at social media. I could post something about saving. Orphans and I'd be attacked as a sex trafficking pedophile. People are such. Animals online. But did she actually say it was because she had received threats that she had the bodyguard? asked Decker. No, I don't believe she did. I guess I just assumed. Last night, did you hear or see anything? asked White. Say between midnight and two, or even before or after that. Flash of headlights turning into the drive next door? Gunshot? Screams or raised voices? Sounds of a fight? She shook her head and sharply cleared her throat. I use a CPAP machine at night, and I take an Ambien. I wasn't going to hear anything. Do you have an alarm system? asked Decker. Oh, sure. But I don't usually turn it on. Why not? asked White curiously. Well, we have a gate and 24-hour security. Decker said, so did the judge. Plus her own private bodyguard. Clearly. Wasn't enough. Klein looked less sure of herself and tapped Ash into the bowl. I guess I. See your point. How about the neighbor on the other side of the judge, asked Decker. The Perlmans? They're in New York. They left last week and will be back tomorrow. They knew Cummins, asked Andrews. Sure, we were all friends. Maya, that's Mrs. Perlman, was a retired lawyer, so she and Julia had that connection. Trevor is her husband, it's her second marriage. Oh, and I think they were the ones who told Julia about the 
protection service she ended up using. Why was that? asked White. I'm not entirely sure, but I think the Perlmans had used them in the past. I don't know why. You'd have to ask them. Decker and White exchanged a glance. Do you know the judge's ex and their son, Tyler? asked Decker. Yes. Barry and Tyler Davidson. Cummins was Julia's maiden name. She kept it after they were married. Saved her some paperwork after the divorce since she didn't have to change it back. They all lived next door. Until the breakup. Barry still lives nearby. When I was married, we would all go out together. After our divorces, Julia and I would still go out, or else have a girl's night in. We'd either cook or do takeout with white wine and Hallmark movies. Although lately she seemed a bit different. How so? asked White. Over the last year or so she wanted to go out more. Dinner, dancing. Hitting the club scene. She was dressing, well, how shall I say, a little. Younger than she had been. Don't get me wrong, she looked fabulous. She was a decade younger than me. She seemed to be having fun. Why not? Her lips started to twitch and tears suddenly clustered at the corners of her eyes. And they had shared custody of Tyler, said White quietly. She dabbed at her eyes with her hand. Yes, one week on and off. But Tyler will be going to college in about a year and a half, so it would have ended then. With Julia gone I guess it ends right now, Klein set her drink. Down and stubbed out her camel. She put a hand to her face and let out a sob. I'm, I'm sorry, I th think it just h hit me that she's really g gone. White produced some Kleenex from a pack in her pocket and passed them across. Klein wiped her eyes. Thank you. She collected herself and continued. In a husky voice, Julia was very nice. Very caring. After my divorce she was so supportive. She talked to you about any problems lately? You ever see any strange cars around or people you didn't recognize loitering? asked Decker. Klein shook her head and finished her drink in one gulp. No, nothing. Like that. Again, this is a gated community so they keep the riffraff out, or at least they're supposed to. You never really talked about the bodyguard? Seems strange between close friends. She lit another camel and blew fresh smoke out. Look, I tried to ask her about that a couple of times, but she shut it down. I respected that, so I didn't push it. I just figured it was crap someone in her position had to put up with. To confirm, she actually told you about the guard, but didn't say why he was there, asked Decker. That's right. When was the last time you saw Barry or Tyler, asked Andrews. Tyler was here last week when he was staying with his mom. Barry, I saw about three weeks ago. He had come by for some reason. Maybe too. Pick up Tyler. How does Tyler usually get here from his dad's place? asked White. Did his parents drive him back and forth? He has his own car, a BMW convertible, and a gate pass, so he usually drives himself. But sometimes his father brings him, or Julia would drive him back to Barry's condo. A couple times I've seen an Uber drop him off. And he has a bike, too. It's not far, a couple of miles. So that's the last time you saw Barry? About three weeks ago, asked. Dakar. No, now that I think about it, I saw him at the clubhouse. Oh, about a week or so ago. The Harbor Club, asked Decker. No, we have a clubhouse here and a golf course. Very challenging. Do. 
You play? No. Why was he there? Well, he was playing golf, nine holes, and then he had lunch. I said. Hello to him. So he's still a member, asked White. Oh, yes. He retained all of that even after the divorce. In fact, it might have been part of the divorce for all I know. What does he do for a living? He runs his own company. Investments, that sort of thing. Does quite. Well. And Julia's house is beautiful. Pool and Biglin I. I have that, too, on a smaller scale, but I don't have the money to really keep it up anymore, she added bitterly. I'm going to have to downsize at some point. Was he the major breadwinner in the marriage? asked White. I wouldn't say that. Before she was a judge, Julia was a high powered lawyer, made a ton of money. And she also came from serious New York money, trust funds, and all that. Her father was a Wall Street bigwig. She got millions from him in inheritance. She was an only child. She wasn't even 50 yet, and now she's dead. Klein shook her head, her expression. One of misery. Do you know who the beneficiary is of her estate? asked Andrews. Klein refocused. I would guess Tyler, but I don't know for certain. He's their only child. I can't believe she'd leave a dime to Barry. You'd have to check with her lawyer to be certain. Do you know who that is? asked White. Duncan Trotter. I know because he handles my stuff, too. Julia. Recommended him, in fact. His office is on Pelican Way, off the main street. In town. He can tell you everything about that. She sat back. Anything. Else? White exchanged glances with Andrews, who shook his head. Then she looked at Decker, who was staring at the sky through the screened roof. Decker, you got anything else for Ms. Klein? Why the divorce? asked Decker. Mine? No, Julia and Barry. Klein shrugged. Why does anyone get divorced? That's what I'm asking. There were issues, just like any marriage. Barry could tell you more. But it would just be from his perspective. And what was your perspective? You said you were good friends. When married, you all socialized as couples. You shared very personal information. You must have an opinion, said Decker. Why do you care about that? Not to be too blunt, but most wives who are murdered are killed by their husbands. Same holds true for ex-wives and ex-husbands. Klein pursed her lips. Her look was clear, she did not want to go there. Julia was as straight as they come. Barry, well, he cut corners. How? He just wasn't much of a rule follower. Can you give us an example? asked White. They were audited about five years ago. Turns out Barry got caught with his hand in the cookie jar, and they had to pay hefty fines and Barry almost went to jail. Julia had only just gotten on the bench. If that had come out before, she probably wouldn't have been confirmed. She filed for divorce shortly afterward. And she was upset, asked White. More like livid. I think that hastened the end of what was already a troubled marriage. Why already troubled? asked White. Barry never grew up. He wanted to be a college frat boy forever. Goofy. And boozing and just having fun. Did he cheat on her? asked White. Not that I know. I actually believe he loved her and only her. Andrews said, okay, anything else, Decker? Decker had looked up at the sky again. When he didn't answer, White. 
put her notebook away, and rose. Well, thank you for your time. We'll probably have follow-up questions. I just want you to catch whoever did this. We want that, too. Andrews rose and looked down at Decker. You ready, Decker? We're heading out. Decker lowered his gaze to Klein. Who told you the judge was dead? What, said Klein, looking surprised. You saw Draymond's body in the study, but you didn't see the judge's body upstairs? That's right. Did the police come over here and tell you? No. I just assumed. I mean, if Julia had been alive, she would have. Come over here. I would have seen her out in the yard. She would have. Called the police herself last night. So you just assumed she was home last night? Yes, that was why the guard was there, I presumed. Decker nodded and rose. Okay. I'm not sure I appreciate the allegations in your questions, Klein said. Irritably. That's okay. People never do. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 9 The security guard at the gate was waiting for them when they returned. To Cummins's house. He held up some printed out pages. Here you go, everybody from the last 24 hours. Andrews reached for the pages but Decker's arm was longer and he got to it first. Thanks. Can you give us a summary? With some local color? The guard said, well, we obviously had lots of people who live here. Come and go. They don't have to sign in. But I saw there are electronic tags on some of the cars with the name of this development on them. So there should be a record of homeowners. Coming and going, right? They're in that stack I just gave you. Thanks. The summary? Oh, well, there were well over a hundred visitors' cars during that period of time. Is that a lot, a little, right on target? asked Decker. It's a little high, but that was because of the golf tournament. That was played yesterday? Yes. And what documentation do visitors need to get through the gate? They have to be on the guest list, called in by a homeowner, or have a temp pass. The contractors go that route usually, though some of them who come really frequently have permanent gate passes. What form do these permanent passes take? Form? I don't understand. Do they have the electronic strips on their windshields that trigger the gate like the homeowners do? Are they paper on the dashboard, or what? Well, they can be either slash or, actually. So the paper ones will have no record of who was actually coming and going? No. I mean, we don't keep a list, we just check to make sure the paper pass is still valid. And we keep a count of vehicles coming through. And contractors are supposed to be gone by 6 p.m., he added. What if a car or truckload of people comes in? Do you do a head count? To see how many come in on paper or electronic passes? Decker asked. What, said the guard, looking confused. He means, said White, if five people come through the gate in one vehicle, do you make sure the same five people go out in that same vehicle? Um. So the answer is no, said Decker, eyeing the papers in his hand like. They were done. Right. And guests who come in after hours. They have to use the call box to phone an off-site security service that. We'll check to see if they're on the list. And people who bike and walk up here? Well, they're usually homeowners or their guests. So you only check vehicles? Well, yeah. Is there camera surveillance here? Um, yeah, but the cameras keep breaking down. Salt air, I guess. But. This is a really safe place. Decker sighed. Not anymore it's not. 
Did you see anyone who looked suspicious or who previously asked about the judge or otherwise seemed nervous or out of place? No, but you should check with the off-site service, too. We will, Andrews assured him. Thanks. The man got back into his white Honda with security stenciled on the side and drove off. The security situation here is not as good as the residents probably think. It is, noted White. It's also typical for this type of gated community, said Andrews. The super rich have whole other layers of sophisticated protection. Too bad for the merely rich, said Decker. Let's go talk to the X and the kid. They're waiting for us at their condo. Klein said it was about two miles from here, Decker said. That's right, replied Andrews. White said, and the X has a security strip on his car, presumably. If so, and he came here last night, it should be in those records, noted. Andrews. Which I think I should keep charge of. Decker glanced at White before handing the batch of papers over to Andrews. Knock yourself out. You can ride over with me, said Andrews. I can bring you back here. After the interview. Where are you staying? He led them over to his Lexus. Doubletree, replied White. We haven't checked in yet. It's not that far. Has a nice restaurant. How well do you know Barry Davidson? asked Decker. Look, if you're trying to get me knocked off this case because of some made up conflict, snapped Andrews. The only thing I'm trying to do, cut in Decker, is solve this case. If you have any helpful information? Andrews glanced at White, who said, We're not in a competition, agent. Andrews. If the positions were reversed, I'd be irked, too. But we're following orders, just like you. So let's just try to get along and nail the sucker who did this. Andrews shot Decker a look. What she said, said Decker. I don't know him that well. We've played golf together exactly once. And that was a tournament where we were paired up. I've had some casual conversations with him over the years, but that's it. Guy have a good rep in his line of work? Nothing that I've ever heard to the contrary. I actually have some friends who are clients. They seem very pleased. And you didn't know about the tax thing five years ago? Andrews looked uncomfortable. There was some local scuttlebutt about that. But I wasn't involved. And the kid? He's a junior in high school, already got some solid college interest for football. I've watched him play. He's really good. Ever in any trouble? Straight as an arrow as far as I know. I'm friends with several of the local cops. They never mentioned anything involving him. I think Tyler knows he has a shot at the big time and doesn't want to screw it up. He's an honor roll student. You seem to know a lot about him, said White. He's sort of a local sports hero. He's nationally ranked at his position. And he won the state heavyweight wrestling title as a sophomore. Now he concentrates on football. Sounds like a real stud, said Decker. White said, Decker played at Ohio State and then for the Cleveland Browns. But I'm not going to hold that against him. Andrews looked up at the huge Decker. Is that right? The Cleveland Browns? And then you became a cop? Odd career trajectory. Decker glanced at White. And getting odder by the minute. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 10 The drive took them past picturesque scenery, wide beaches, birds. Roaming the skies, high-rise condos, and oceanfront estates lurking behind. Sturdy gates and high walls. And all the way Decker ignored this and just 
stared out the rear window, seeing only images in his head. His wife dead, his daughter dead, years and years now in the grave. Just. Recently, Mary Lancaster departed by her own desperate hand. And the very. Much alive Alex Jameson and Melvin Mars and Ross Bogart all moving on. With their lives. And here I am with a new partner and this. Two more murders, the. Puzzle that always comes along with it, the interviews, the questions, the. Lies in response, more questions and confrontations and just plain bullshit. That both the innocent and guilty continually spew out. And then it gets. Solved and off I go to the next one. From Florida to North Dakota and all points in between. He turned to see White staring at him from the front passenger seat. The woman had seen a slice of life that Decker never would. It had no doubt. Made her tough, ferocious in defense, but crafty and cagey and knowing she had to play by a set of rules that were biased against her to a degree that should alarm everyone but somehow never really did. I'm not sure I have enough in the bank to offer up cash for your thoughts, she said, tacking on a smile. Decker looked away. In his mind's eye he saw Mary Lancaster lift a trembling hand with a gun in it to her mouth, insert the barrel, close her eyes, and end her life in one of the most tragic ways possible. Then, instead of Lancaster's face, Decker saw his own countenance. He was staring at a toilet on which sat his daughter. Father and daughter were barely a foot away from each other. One staring helpless, crushed beyond all conceivable human limits, the other staring back at him and seeing nothing because the dead could not. He had taken out his service pistol and laid it in his mouth. The muzzle of the Glock had felt metallically bitter, the barrel oil leaching onto his tongue. He had looked at Molly and then closed his eyes. His finger had slipped to the trigger and it would have only taken a couple foot-pounds of force to propel him into death with his daughter and wife. Such a simple move, one he had done thousands of times on the gun range and several times while doing his job in the field. And yet, unlike Mary Lancaster, he had pulled the gun free and waited for the cops to show up. Had I been too cowardly? Had I lacked the courage that Mary had in abundance? And she left her daughter and husband behind. An option I didn't have, and one I don't think I could have taken. Decker? He broke from his thoughts to see White staring worriedly at him. This annoyed him. How much longer, he brusquely asked Andrews. Coming up to the security gate now. Does anybody around here live in a place without a guard gate? asked. Dakar. Is it that fucking dangerous here? Andrews eyed him in the rear view, as though checking to see if Decker was perhaps joking. He said, I don't have a guard gate in my neighborhood. I guess I don't make enough money. Has anyone spoken to the Davidsons yet? asked White. Local cops. Just to inform them of Cummins's death. They deferred the rest to us. We'll need to establish alibis, said White. And what about a search? Warrant for the ex's condo? The woman's body was just found this morning, said Andrews. Let's take it one step at a time. And we have no grounds for a search warrant. Yet, amended Decker. They cleared security and took the elevator up to the fourth floor of the condo building with a broad view of the gulf on the rear side. The elevator. Doors opened and they were in a small vestibule with one large wooden door. Andrews knocked on it, and a few moments later they heard footsteps approaching. The teenager was large, about 6'3 and 240. He was dressed in dark blue workout compression shorts, was barefoot, and had on a white tank top. 
decorate his physique and noted the bulging quads and thick calves, the broad shoulders, the lanky, muscled arms. The kid already had a collegiate body, he assessed. Now if he had some decent wheels and quick twitch muscle mass, he might have a nice college run. The NFL was a whole other matter. The funnel there got as narrow as a needle's eye. Tyler, said Andrews, who showed the young man his badge and ID. He introduced Decker and White. We understand your father is here? He's drunk, mumbled Tyler, who looked to Decker like he was on. Something though his pupils looked normal. Shit-faced. He shook his head, his expression pained, and his eyes bloodshot from crying. Is mom. Really? Yes, Tyler, I'm afraid she is, said Andrews. His big hands curled to knotty fists. I'm gonna fucking kill whoever did. This. Andrews put a hand on his shoulder. No, you're not, Tyler. It's our job. To deal with this, and we will. We will find whoever did this, and they will. Never see another free day. I promise you that. Now we really need to talk. To your dad. And you, interjected Decker. Andrews frowned at this, but nodded. And you too. But please take us to. Your father. Tyler turned and led them down a hallway. They passed an expensive-looking electric bike that was parked against one wall, its power pack. Plugged in. Nice ride, said Decker. My dad got it for me. Florida is pretty flat, but when you're doing 30-40 miles at a fast clip under your own power, the motor comes in handy. Sometimes. Decker looked around as they passed minimalist furnishings and decor. Lots of gleaming metal and glass and walls painted white to take advantage of the strong Florida light. The rear windows gave sweeping views of the gulf, where ships seemingly no larger than toys made their way slowly across the water or else bobbed up and down at anchor. Tyler pushed a door open and motioned them in. Sitting in a leather recliner was, apparently, Barry Davidson. He had on jeans, a white polo shirt, and no shoes or socks. A glass with some dark liquid rested on his flat stomach with one of the man's hands wrapped loosely around it. His eyes were closed and Decker wasn't even sure the guy was awake or alive. Mr. Davidson, said Andrews. We need to talk. Davidson made no reaction to this. Dad, shouted Tyler, putting a massive hand on his father's shoulder and violently shaking him. The glass went sideways, and whatever was in it spilled across the man's shirt and jeans. The eyes popped open and the recliner came forward, and Barry Davidson would have fallen to the floor if Decker had not been quick enough to catch him. What? Who, said Davidson, shaking his head and blinking rapidly. It's the cops, Dad. The FBI. They need to talk to you. Tyler shook his head, a disgusted look on his face. He picked up the now empty glass and placed it on a table. Decker looked around the room and noted that it was set up as a home. Office with wooden file cabinets, shelving, a desktop printer copier, a postage meter, and other office supplies and equipment arrayed around the space. A large computer screen with a digital webcam attached sat on a large glass-topped desk. He imagined the guy probably did a lot of Zoom meetings from here. French doors opened to a covered balcony. Davidson rubbed his eyes, slapped himself a couple of times on the cheeks, and looked up at Andrews. I can know you, right? Doug Andrews. We played golf together once at the Harbor Club. A still dazed Davidson pointed a shaky hand at him. Right, right, never. Forget a guy's game. You can hit it a mile, but you putt like shit. Grips all. 
Wrong and you have too much backswing. Andrews smiled embarrassedly at White. Never considered quitting my day job. Decker stepped forward. We're here to talk to you about your former wife's death. Davidson nodded, his head dipping and bobbing like he might be sick. White took a step back to avoid being in the pathway. Right, all right, said Davidson. She's dead. Someone fucking murdered her, Dad, snapped Tyler. Get your shit. Together, will you? Andrews put up a hand. Come on, Tyler, your dad's been through a lot. I've been through a lot. Mom went through the most of all. You don't. See me getting stoned. He shot his father another disgusted look. Andrews said, a forensics team will be by later to take your prints. Why, said Tyler. For elimination purposes. Your prints will be all over the house, Tyler. Since you live there every other week. But we need to ID prints like yours. And your father's so we can focus on any strange ones that might be there. I, I haven't been inside H. Her house in a couple weeks, said Davidson. His eyes rolling around in their sockets. When I went to pick up Tyler. We'll still need to take your prints, said Andrews. J. Julius D. dead, Davidson said, starting to sob. Decker put a hand on his shoulder. Mr. Davidson, why don't you go? Grab a shower and get some fresh clothes on. We'll make you some coffee. And get some water into you for hydration to knock the buzz off and then. We can talk, okay? It's really important. The first 48 hours are the most critical of all for any murder investigation. He helped Davidson to stand and then looked at Tyler, who was staring. Out the window, his arms folded over his heaving chest. Decker glanced at Andrews. Let's get him to the bathroom. Tyler called out, bring me his clothes. I'll put them in the wash to get the stink of the booze out. Decker and Andrews helped Davidson to the bathroom, got the shower going, and pulled out some towels and toiletries. They got the man stripped down and into the shower. Then Decker left him there with Andrews and gave the soiled clothes to Tyler. He followed Tyler to a laundry room, where he threw the clothes into the washing machine. Didn't know I was going to have to clean up after my dad, Tyler said. Sullenly. I did my stuff earlier. I had my run early this morning with the guys and got soaked through. I'm a big sweater. Yeah, me too. But we have a lot more skin than most people. I guess. He turned the machine on, leaned against the wall, and then abruptly started to sob. Decker let him do so for a bit before saying, Can I get you anything? Tyler? And no. Tyler wiped his face, composed himself, and suddenly eyed. Decker's large frame. You look like you might have played some ball. Ohio State. And the NFL, for the briefest of times. I was a walk-on with. The Browns. The Ohio State University already offered me a scholarship. And I've got three other offers. Great school. Great program. Where else? Alabama, Georgia, and Stanford. The best of the best. You want to play in the NFL? He shook his head. I'm not at that level and never will be. Most young men your age wouldn't be able to make that sort of frank self-assessment. They usually think they're good enough. I've been making frank assessments all my life. I want to go into business. Silicon Valley. That's where a lot of cool stuff is happening. Well, they're all great schools, but Stanford is right where you want to end up. And they play a pro-style offense. So as a tight end, you'll get a lot of throws your way. Tyler looked intrigued. 
How'd you know I played tight end? You've got the build, the height, and your hands have calluses and abrasions all over them, especially the palms and the fingertips. I could be a QB. QBs throw the ball, they don't catch it. You get that level of toughened skin from frequent high-velocity impacts with the pigskin. Wide receiver, then. You're too beefy to play wide out. Those guys are slim with lightning in their shoes. And a high school coach would never waste a guy your size on that position. You could play any slot on the line with your beef. And they'd use you as an extra lineman on running plays. Yeah, I pretty much do exactly that. What position did you play in? College? OLB, said Decker, referring to outside linebacker. You're big for that. I've put on weight since then, but I had decent wheels. They tried me. On the D-line, but even back then those boys were all 320 plus. And I wasn't athletic enough to hold my own at 260 against O-lines. Where the tackles made me look like a middle schooler. OSU plays in the big leagues and the NFL is another planet. With the Browns I did most of my field time on special teams. I was never going to be a starter. Guys we play against in high school are running 4 threes like it's nothing. White said, well, not to put a stop to the shop talk, guys, but they turned to see her standing a few feet from them. Decker glanced at her and said to Tyler, you want to talk here or somewhere else? How about the beach? White hiked her eyebrows at Decker. You mean out on all that sand? She said. Fine, said Decker. Why don't you wait here, Agent White? And let them know where we went. White was about to protest, but then she glanced at Tyler and slowly nodded. Sure, I can let you footballers have some alone time. The two big men walked off, leaving White to sit down in a chair and wait, her lips pursed and her gaze hanging on Decker's broad back. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 11 I'm, you am, I'm sorry about your mother, said Decker as they reached the sand and headed south. Decker had taken off his shoes and socks and rolled up his pants. Tyler had slipped off his flip-flops and was carrying them. Decker was awkward at social encounters like this. As a young man, before his brain injury, he could be empathetic and consoling and even glib. Now, on the other side of his near-death experience, he was none of those things. I think I'm gonna wake up and she'll be there waving at me. I can understand that. So, when was the last time you actually saw your mother? I stayed with her last week, this week I'm with my dad. Tough going back and forth? It was at first, but then I got into a routine. Well, I did with mom. Dad. Never has had much of a routine. So you saw her last a week ago? No, I had lunch with her three days ago at the golf clubhouse where she lives. Wasn't she at the courthouse then? She had the afternoon off, she said. She seemed okay, no problems? Yeah, she was fine. Did you ever meet her private bodyguard? No. When I was with her last week, she didn't have a bodyguard. Around. That remark caught Decker by surprise, but he decided not to comment. On it. But at some point did she tell you that she had one? Yeah, she mentioned it at lunch. I asked her what was up. And what did she say? She said it was over some stupid stuff from being a judge, but she didn't want to take chances. She wasn't more specific? No. But she'd gotten threats in the past and nothing had come of it. Were you worried that you might be in danger while you were over? There? I'm a big guy, I can take care of myself. But I always worried about my mom. 
lots of psychos out there, you know. When you were over there, did you ever see anything weird? Nope. By the time I got home after school, I was pretty beat. Usually. Ate dinner, listened to some music, did my schoolwork, and then hit the sack. You on a year-round workout schedule? He nodded. We were runner-up for state, so everyone's gunning for us. The team that beat us lost half their starters to graduation while we're still stacked. I was first team Allstate as a junior. And even though I've got my scholarship offers, my take is I've got to be even better than I was last year. Weight room, cardio, playbooks, passing and blocking drills. Never stops. Same way in college. And in the pros, it's your life. Maybe I'll make enough money to buy my own team one day. There you go. So you never saw or heard anything else troubling your mother? Except for my dad. What do you mean? Decker said sharply. Tyler suddenly looked fearful. No, hey, I just mean, well, he's like a little kid who never grew up. Nothing wrong with that. He just loves life. You know? I get that, but was that the reason for the divorce? Yeah, and there was some dumb tax issue that she was really upset. About. This was about five years ago, after she became a judge. She filed for. Divorce pretty soon after that. I didn't really get it. I mean, blow up a. Marriage over taxes? They both had plenty of money. Anyway, mom didn't. Like dad's lifestyle after the divorce, and she didn't want dad having his. Girlfriend stay over while I was with him. She didn't think it was right. What did you think about that? Well, I have to admit, it was nice seeing the young ladies running. Around the condo in t-shirts and pretty much nothing else, or tanning themselves on one of the balconies or by the pool, but it did get old after a while. I mean, it was my dad. And they were only in it for his money. Anyway, even though he does keep himself in decent shape, he's almost 50. Twenty-something ladies don't go for that without the cash to back it. Up. So, you were with your father last night? Here? Yeah. I got home around seven. We had dinner, watched some TV, and I finished some schoolwork. Then I went to bed. What time? About 10.30 or so. I was beat. And your dad? I heard him talking in his office. My bedroom's right next door. He has. Clients all over the world, so he operates in different time zones. Kept. Waking me up when he went on the Zooms. It's like he thinks he has to talk. Loud because they're in Asia and shit. Happened to check the time when you woke up? It was off and on. And I didn't go back to sleep right away. Once was. Around one or so. I remember because I was thinking I had to get up at six. To go for my run and I was pissed. Okay. And another time was after two. I remember looking at my apple. Watch. And then again close to three. Okay. And while I was trying to fall asleep I heard him in his office before. Then walking around and practicing his pitch, you know, what he says to his. Clients. He does that all the time. So let me get this straight. You heard your father either on a Zoom call or walking around and practicing his pitch when, exactly? Well, pretty much from like before midnight until almost three. You mean you never fell asleep? Okay, yeah, I did. Around three when I heard him get up and leave his office. So he might have left the condo after that, but I don't think so. I heard him pass my room and then his bedroom door opened and closed. It has a weird squeaking sound. 
Then I heard his shower start up. He showers at three? Like I said, he keeps weird hours because of his business. And he sweats like I do, especially when he's dealing with clients. He says they're very demanding. And the showers help to calm him, let him get relaxed for bed. And he usually has a drink before he goes to bed. Decker took all this in. Okay, thanks for that. He cared for my mom. A lot. This blew him away. He's been crying all. Morning and drinking like a fucking fish. He paused and looked out to the. Water. I think part of him is also terrified that he's the sole parent now. He. Can't drop all the responsibility on mom anymore. She really did it all with. Me. Safety prep, schoolwork, doctor's appointments, making sure I was all set. For the prom, helping pick out colleges, dealing with recruiters, writing my ass on grades. She never missed one of my football games. And when I was younger, I played every sport, and she was right there. She even coached one of my little league teams. Sounds like a superwoman, considering she was a lawyer and then a judge. Yeah, we were all real proud of her when she got to be a federal judge. The freaking president of the United States had to nominate her. I mean, is that cool or what? Pretty cool. Tyler shook his head. Now what's going to happen? You're going to finish high school, go to a great college, and make your mom proud. But with her not here, I'm not sure I can keep my shit together. Anymore. Anytime you start thinking that, think about all the things your mother did to get you ready for life. It was worth it to her, so it has to be worth it to you. It shows respect. Tyler looked at him funny. Sounds like you lost somebody close, too. Decker eyed the young man and saw in him a bit of his younger self. Supremely confident in his athletic abilities, unsure of everything else. We've all lost somebody close, Tyler. It's how we deal with it that counts, because if you mess that up nothing else really matters. You're listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 12 I had a Zoom conference with a client in Hong Kong from 2 a.m. to around 3. Before that I was speaking with another client in Beijing from midnight to 1. I prepped for the Beijing meeting from around 11. 15 on, and for the Hong Kong meeting after the Beijing call. There. Both 12 hours ahead of us. Then I grabbed a shower, had a scotch, and went to bed. Barry Davidson had showered and changed his clothes. After a couple cups of coffee and two bottles of water, he seemed more composed and focused. They were back in his office. Tyler had left to get some air. We'll need to check any video recordings you made and talk with those. Folks, said Andrews. Do you really consider me a suspect in Julia's murder? snapped Davidson. Decker said, spouses and ex-spouses are always suspects until their alibis are established. I never went near Julia's place last night. White glanced at Decker. Okay, let's move on from there, Mr. Davidson. In speaking with your wife, did she voice any concerns? Was she having problems with someone? Maybe a case she was overseeing? Julia and I don't didn't really talk much about her work. I'm not a lawyer, and that world is pretty foreign to me. And she never really got what I did for a living, though it provided very well for us. I understand your ex-wife also came from money and lawyers and federal judges make good income, said White. I'm not saying I was the major breadwinner or anything, although I made far more than her salary. As a judge, she was dramatically underpaid. In my opinion, 
have to take that up with Congress, noted Decker. When was the last time you saw or talked to her? A few days ago. She wanted to remind me about Tyler taking his allergy meds. He needs to get on it early with spring starting. I'm on Zyrtec. Year-round myself. And you saw her last when? You mentioned you were at her house a couple weeks ago to pick up Tyler. Julia wasn't at the house then. Let me think a minute. Yeah, it was at school. About a week ago. There was an awards program at school. Tyler was getting the Student Athlete of the Year. Nice, said White. I'm sure you were both proud. He works hard and deserves it. I was never much of an athlete in high school, and I didn't do any sports in college. He gets some of his size from me, but Julia was a great swimmer and tennis player. His athleticism definitely came from her. He looked up at them, his face a tapestry of misery. How, how did she die? No one told me. White exchanged a glance with Decker, who said, she was stabbed, Mr. Davidson. Oh my God. He put his head in his hands. Andrews pulled out his phone. Something was left beside her body. Davidson looked up. What? Andrews held up his phone. This note. Davidson looked at them. Residential ipsiloquitur? Sounds like Latin. What's it mean? We hoped you could provide some information about it, and also about any enemies she might have had. I don't know Latin. And she had no enemies that I knew of. Andrews said, I did a preliminary check of her past trials. She's overseen a number of drug cases, syndicates, gangs. Some pretty dangerous characters. I, I guess. I just never focused on that, said Davidson. And she had a personal bodyguard. Any idea why? asked Decker. Tyler mentioned something about that after he had lunch with her, so I texted Julia to see what was up. She never got back to me. Decker nodded, looking thoughtful. Do you have any enemies? Davidson looked up in surprise. She had the bodyguard, not me. Maybe she was more cautious. So, any enemies? Davidson looked away. And no. No enemies. Look, I, I need to end this. Interview. I'm going to be sick. He rushed from the room. They walked outside and stood around Andrews's car. Anything from your talk with Tyler, asked White. Confirmed his father's alibi in all respects, so unless the kid is lying to cover for his old man, which I don't think he is, Barry might be off the suspect list if the TOD holds. Tyler said he never saw any security guard around his mother's place while he was there. But he did say his mother told him about it and that it was about some stupid stuff having to do with her job. That's probably Tyler's word choice, not the judge's. How would he not see a guard there? Well, if the guard was outside the whole time and he arrived and then left while Tyler was sleeping, it could be the case. We need to get that info. From the company. So the X may be free and clear, said White. Decker said, not necessarily. We could be looking at a murder for hire. Then his alibi is meaningless. When Decker got into the car and closed the door his phone buzzed. He recognized the number. It was Earl Lancaster. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 13 Earl, is anything wrong? said Decker anxiously. It's Sandy, Amos. Decker felt his gut clench. Sandy. What's the matter? 
is she okay? I tried to talk to her about her mom. But I could make no headway. Decker relaxed. Earl, the police department has some really good grief. Counselors. They can talk to Sandy. A clearly desperate Earl Lancaster interrupted. We've tried that, Amos. It was no good. The thing is. What? Sandy wants to talk to you. To me. Decker looked up as Andrews started the car. White was looking at. Decker curiously. He lowered his voice. Why does she want to talk to me? Because she says you never lie to her. The thing is, Earl, I'm down in Florida on a case. I can't get away right. Now. That's okay. She just wants to talk to you. Can you do it now? She's. Very insistent. Decker looked up at White, who was still staring at him. She wants to. Talk to me now? What am I supposed to say? That Earl's voice dropped. That her mom had to go away but will. Always be looking down on her, watching her, something like that. Decker. Heard a noise. All right, Sandy, all right, here he is. Decker heard some shuffling as the phone was passed over. Then Sandy's voice came on. Are you Amos Decker? Decker thought about clicking off. But then he imagined Sandy's small, hopeful face and he just couldn't. Yeah, Sandy, this is Amos Decker. I want my mommy, Amos Decker, but nobody will tell me where she is. Will you tell me where she went? Please? As per her nature, Sandy was speaking loudly, and by the expression on White's face she could hear it all. She noted Decker staring at her, helplessly, and quickly looked away. Decker said, she, your, mommy had to go away, Sandy. No. That's what they said, but mommy would never, ever go away. Without saying goodbye to me. She loves me. You're lying to me, and you. Never lie. She began to cry. Decker thought about the words Earl had suggested he use, but he knew. That Sandy would see right through that and things would only get worse. She might have mental disabilities, but in some ways she was far sharper. Than he was. And this was one of those ways because it dealt right with the. Heart. Sandy, will you listen to me? Not if you say mommy went away, I won't, she said in a choked voice. Do you, Decker, could barely believe he was about to say this, but he could think of nothing else. He didn't want to fail Sandy, as he had her. Mother. Do you remember my daughter, Molly? You two played together. Sandy's tone instantly brightened. Sure, I remember Molly. She was. Very nice to me. And then you remember that Molly went away one day, right? All right. I didn't want her to go away, but she had to because, well, it wasn't her. Choice. She didn't want to leave me, but something made her. Mommy said something happened to her. That someone hurt her. That's right. Someone hurt my daughter and she had to go away. Sandy. Andrews caught White's eye. He looked distraught and shaken. She shook her head and put a finger to her lips. And so did Molly's mommy, said Sandy. I remember. Yes, Molly's mommy, too, they both went away at the same time. Someone made them go, they didn't want to. Did they say goodbye? Sandy, close your eyes. What, why? Just close your eyes, please, it's important. Okay. Are they closed? asked Decker. Yes. Now, think of your mom. What is she doing? She's smiling at me. She always smiles at me. That's right. Every time she talked to me about you, she was smiling. 
because your mom loved you more than anything, just like I loved my daughter. On this, White made a fist and pushed it against her mouth. Her eyes were closed, but some tears trickled out. Do you see Molly when you close your eyes? Sandy asked. Yes, I do, all the time. I see her mommy, too. And I think that's why. They, and your mom, never said goodbye. Because when you say goodbye. Like that, it means they won't see us again. But they will. You see her right. Now. And I'm closing my eyes and there are Molly and her mom. I see them. Right now and they're smiling at me. So, no goodbyes. They're always. There, Sandy. We just have to close our eyes and say hello and then they. Come to us. They're right there, with us. All the time. Hi, Mommy, said Sandy. It's me, Sandy. And even if she doesn't seem to say anything back, Sandy, in your mind. You know everything she would say. Molly always called me Pops. So right. Now I hear Motley calling me that. Mommy calls me Sandy Dandy. I know. And she's probably calling you that right now. I can hear her. I really, really can. It's me, Mommy, Sandy Dandy. Yeah, I can hear her, too. I'm going to go show her some new dresses that Daddy got me. I'm sure she'll love to see them. You really are Amos Decker, aren't you? Yeah, I really am Amos Decker. For better or worse. A few moments later Earl came on. My God, Amos, I don't know what. You said, but she's totally changed. She ran upstairs laughing her head off. And saying Sandy Dandy over and over. He paused. Amos, you still. There? I'm here. Thank you so much. Yeah, look, I gotta go. Decker clicked off and stared down at the phone. Andrews gave White a questioning look. She said, take us back to our rental. I think it's time we checked in at the hotel and had some food. And, maybe, a drink. As the car pulled away White glanced surreptitiously at Decker. The man just kept looking at his phone. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 14 I won't ask you if you want to talk about it, because I know what the answer will be. Decker and White were sitting in the dining area of the Doubletree. Their meal was done. Decker had a beer, while White fingered a glass of Marlowe. Decker ignored this and finished his beer. He was standing up to leave. When she said, I had three kids, Decker. Now I only have two. He sat back down. What happened? Rival gangs going at it out on our street. They spewed rounds all over. The place. One came through the wall of our house. My son, Dante, had sat. Up in bed when he heard all the noise. Bullet caught him right here. She. Placed a trembling finger to her left temple. I'm sorry. When did it happen? Five years ago. She paused and looked down. He was my middle. Child. I had my kids right in a row. My biological clock was ticking. I knew. I wanted three. I thought I could handle it, FBI career and all. Until my ex. Walked out the door when I was still carrying Jackie. Luckily my mom came. To the rescue. I, I wasn't home when it happened. I was away on an, a. Sob broke through, but she quickly quelled it. She wiped her mouth with her. Napkin and looked up, but didn't meet Decker's gaze. Away on an. Assignment, she finished. Decker tapped his fingers nervously on the table. He didn't want to break. 
the silence because he was unsure about what to say. But finally he decided to say something because he sensed that it had taken a lot of courage for White to make such a gut-wrenching admission. And she deserved something in kind from him. Sandy is my old partner's daughter. She has some mental disabilities, so she couldn't really understand about her mom. That's why her dad called me. Sandy and I, we sort of have a trust thing going on. What you told her was really good, Decker. It was pretty much spot on. For the situation. I don't normally talk about what happened to my family. It's just not. Something I, do. I don't, either. But I just thought we needed an icebreaker. Fair enough. They say time heals, but I'm not sure about that. Not at all. Time doesn't necessarily heal, but it allows perspective and the fading of the loss. But not for me. He placed a finger against his head. I can't forget. Not even a little bit. Nothing fades, nothing gets better. It's a new movie release every day, but it's the same movie. But you can remember the good times too, right? Better than the rest of us can with ours. I'm starting to fade on some of that stuff with Dante. I don't want it to, but I've got two kids and a career that suck up all I've got. Decker rubbed at his mouth. It doesn't make up for it. It's not apples to apples. I can see that. And I can also see that you are done with the personal stuff. So let's get to the professional. Impressions today? Decker automatically re-engaged. Barry Davidson is not being truthful. About something, I just don't know what. Tyler is confused and hurt. I want. To talk to Gamma Protection Services and see why they were guarding the. Judge. And I want to know what the note represents. Residential Ipsiloquitur. I've heard it before, but I googled it to be sure. Legal jargon. Means. Something like, the thing proves itself. Right, I checked that too. Must be important, at least to the killer, which. Makes it important to us. You think it stems from her caseload, something in the past? The. Blindfold, too? Maybe some defendant thought she screwed them. Justice. Wasn't blind, that sort of thing? Decker said, Tyler thought her getting protection had something to with. Her position as a judge. But she might have not been straight with him about. That. It might have something to do with her ex-husband. Barry Davidson. Has money, a thriving international business. He likes to party, have the. Young ladies over, or so Tyler told me. He might have screwed with somebody or embezzled some funds from a shady client, and this was the result. They get back at him by killing her. Or, like you suggested before, he could have hired someone to do it. Either way, we need to check his financial records. Andrews is already on that. But let's discuss the possibility that. Someone else killed her because they had a beef against Barry. But why kill the judge and not him, asked White. You kill him, maybe you don't get your money back. If so, and he knows who it is? And maybe that's what he's not telling. Us? Decker said, he'll either eventually tell us, go after them on his own. Keep his mouth shut because he's afraid, which would get my vote, or disappear because he's scared shitless. I like how you summarize things. So neat and orderly. He eyed her kagily. Jameson told you about the electric blue, right? White did not answer. She just kept watching him steadily. When I walked into the judge's house and had my little moment, I saw the look on your face. 
Death equals electric blue. You knew that. I could read it in your face. She did tell me, yes, White conceded. And this was not just idle chatter from a long time ago. You called her. After you got assigned to partner with me. And to her credit she didn't want to tell me anything. She's totally loyal. To you, if you have any doubt about that. But I used my girl agent to girl agent card. Anything else I need to know from the girl agent exchange system? I'll let you know if it becomes relevant. She paused. Does that tick? You off? No, it's actually the only thing you've said so far that made me smile. She gaped. You smiled? When? Because I didn't see it. I do it internally. She smiled resignedly. Of course you do. They went to their rooms. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. White immediately phoned home and talked to her mother and then her. Kids. She had a lot to catch up on even though she hadn't been gone that long. It was good to hear their voices, especially now, with so much change going. On in her life. While she was doing that, Decker sat on his bed and stared out the window, where the sun had long since faded, but he could hear the roar of the gulf through the glass. He closed his eyes and once more envisioned the gun in Mary. Lancaster's hand. He watched as she lifted it to her mouth, inserted it between her lips, letting the muzzle rest on the tongue, because it was very awkward to hold a gun that way. Then her finger would slip to the trigger. She probably closed her eyes, let her mind wander to wherever it needed to. And then, he opened his eyes, rose, and walked over to the window. The ocean. View was inspiring, vast, sprawling, infinite, smooth, yet somehow chaotic. Clunky, unpredictable to him. After he'd lost his wife and child, Decker had only wanted to be left alone. Part of him still felt that way. Yet part of him was terrified of having no one left either. Sometimes it was just him, and his mind. My ever-changing mind. Just like the rest of my life. Always fluid, never stable. And according to the good folks at the Cognitive Institute, the ride is going to get a lot bumpier. Later, his phone buzzed. He didn't recognize the number and it wasn't in his contacts because no name came up. Decker, he said. Agent Decker, this is Helen Jacobs. I'm the medical examiner? I remember you, Ms. Jacobs. So, Draymond's gun? Had not been fired. But there's something else. What? He was killed by two gunshot wounds to the heart, I confirmed that. But, prompted Decker. But I also found what looks to be a wad of cash crammed down his throat. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook. Chapter 15 Decker roused White from her room and they drove over to the medical. Examiner's office, a one-story, low-slung concrete building that was so ugly. It seemed unjust to bring someone's remains here to be legally cut up. Helen Jacobs met them at the front door. She had on a long white lab coat, and her hair was done up in a bun and covered with a blue surgical cap. White said, did you contact Agent Andrews as well? Yes. But he didn't answer, so I left a message. Let's go, said Decker impatiently. Jacobs led them down a long corridor with scuffed white walls, cheap laminate flooring, and feeble fluorescent light. She unlocked one door with her security card and ushered them in. This room was outfitted with stainless steel tables, sinks, and lots of drains, striker saws, scalpels and other medical instruments, a tool that looked like a crowbar, organ scales, iPads resting on rolling tables, and mics dangling from the ceiling so the medical examiners could record in. 
real-time their thoughts and findings. Against one wall were the rollout beds behind closed cabinet doors, the wall of death, as Decker always saw it. The electric blue had hit him as soon as Jacobs had unlocked the door. He noticed White noticing him, but the look he gave the woman caused her to glance sharply away. On one dissecting table was Alan Draymond. He'd already been cut up. Though the incision that had sliced a Y-shape across the front of his torso had not yet been sewn back up. Exposed were the man's innards. Dakar saw that his organs had already been removed and then repacked inside the body cavity in viscera bags. His scalp had been cut away and draped over his face, the skull had been cut open and the brain removed. Jacobs used a gloved hand to pull the skin back, reconstituting the man's face. She used forceps to open the mouth wide and then directed a light inside. The opening. You can see it now. I didn't want to remove it until you got here. The two agents, white on tiptoes, bent over for a look. You sure it was done post-mortem, he said. Pretty sure, yes. He glanced at her. Pretty sure? The gunshots to the chest clearly killed him. The loss of blood shows that his heart was beating normally when that happened. There were no signs on the body of restraint, defensive wounds, or a struggle, though. Decker's mind leapt ahead of her words. Meaning a man getting a wad of cash shoved down his throat is going to at least struggle against it. It would be like he was choking to death, added White. He'd fight, or they'd have to restrain him first. Jacob said, and he'd have gag reflex and there would be evidence of that in his larynx and on his tongue and other indicia. None of that is present, only the abrasions one would find by ramming an object like this down someone's throat after they were dead. Decker eyed White and said, some sort of message? Punishment or revenge? That would make Draymond the target and not the judge, said White. Who's to say he wasn't? And they had to kill the judge because she came downstairs, saw what was happening, and was attacked. She fled upstairs, where they finished her off. He stopped. But then why the note and blindfold left with the judge? Maybe that was just meant to throw us off, suggested White. Decker said to Jacobs, get the wad out of his mouth. She used another set of forceps to accomplish this and the money slowly emerged from the dead man's mouth, the last thing that would ever pass. Through that portal. She laid it on a clean cloth on a side table. Decker put on a pair of latex gloves he pulled from a box and gingerly started to unfold the money. That doesn't look like George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or Andrew Jackson, noted White as she peered around him. The currency had the images of a white-bearded man looking out and a dark-bearded man staring to the left. Narodna Banka Slavinska, Decker read off. Pat Deziat. It's worth fifty. Of something. White pulled out her phone and typed in a search. She waited and then. The result came in. It's Slovakian. The Koran was the currency until the end of 2008. Now. They use the euro. The two guys are St. Cyril and St. Methodius. So the personal bodyguard of a murdered federal judge had old and no. Longer legal tender Slovakian banknotes stuffed in his mouth after he'd been shot to death, said Decker. He unrolled all of the bills, counted up the amount, pulled out his phone, and translated the money into dollars using an online currency calculator. At the old exchange rate, it's worth less than $50. But it's now worthless, noted White. It looks like someone was making some sort of a point, opined Jacobs. We need to find out all about Alan Draymond, said Decker. His employer, Gamma Protection Services, would be a good place to 
Start, replied White. You are listening to audiobooks at Fox Audiobook.